It's that time again. The annual conference of the American Society of Ag Consultants, otherwise known as ASAC, is going to be held in Fort Myers, Florida, this November 4th and 5th. Kirk Covington is one of nine professionals who will address the conference. The other speakers who will cover a wide range of topics represent Florida Farm Bureau, Florida Citrus Commission, University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture, National Ag Law Center, Risk Mitigators and Advisors, Tyler Associates, as well as the lead economist for dairy at Cobank, and myself, Chrissy Wozniak, from North American Ag. The day and a half of presentations will be followed by ag tours on Tuesday afternoon at Echo Farms, one of my favorite places here in Fort Myers. Attendees will experience farming at its most creative, with unique demonstrations, plants, and techniques being used to help farmers and urban gardeners in developing countries. A second tour at ECHO will showcase simple technologies that can improve food, water, and shelter for millions of people. A third tour of a hydroponic grower is also being planned. For more information and to register, visit www.agconsultants.org. That's www.agconsultants.org. See you there. If only you could be everywhere at once. Tech Agriculture helps farmers manage uncertainty and stress by remotely monitoring their field crops and connecting them with timely agronomic advice. Traditional crop scouting demands precious time or experienced scouts who are in short supply. Today's growers and agronomists increasingly make use of aerial drones and satellite imagery for a view of the big picture in a field. Tech Ag bridges the gap by using electric dirt bikes to travel between rows or long sprayer tracks to collect high-resolution imagery that can be used to head off production risks before they develop into costly production challenges. Integrations with a growing list of farm management software partners allow growers and trusted advisors to view imagery on their preferred platform. For more information, visit their website at tech.ag. That's www.tecc.ag. Get peace of mind with remote, timely field and crop scouting imagery wherever you are, whenever you want. Tech Agriculture. Hi, and welcome to the North American Ag Spotlight. I'm Chrissy Wozniak. Our guest today joins us from Nebraska. He's a sixth generation farmer, popular radio show host and podcaster, and he's dedicated to exploring the people and places of rural America. And he tends to tackle some tough political issues that affect agriculture. And now he's embarked on a new adventure. He's been chosen as running mate for Nebraska's GOP candidate, Teresa Thibodeau. I'd like to welcome back to Egg Spotlight, Trent Luce. Welcome, Trent. And thanks uh, so much. Can I just me. say it's been far too long, Chrissy? You've been AWOL on me. Where you been? You no, know, I've been <laughs> sitting in the sun in Florida where I should be. <laughs> you know, let's talk about that because everybody thinks that Florida is the place to be and the DeSantis is the w- most wonderful governor. We're fixing to change that. and Everybody's going to be talking about Nebraska as the place that empowered its citizens once again. We may not have the beaches or the Florida sun, but we can have empowerment of the people. I hope you're right. I am very excited about this. So tell me about this this partnership. How did this happen? And um, she's the, the former state senator as well, right? Correct. She's a mother, a wife, former educator. Uh, Teresa had an early learning program and I had a mutual friend, you know, I got a lot of friends and that's really what it's about. Just like you, one day, one of my mutual friends, her name's Kimberly Fletcher, who is a champion for particularly women and, and empowering women to stand up and be heard and be on the right side of issues and get back to, you know, the natural law, law of order, so to speak. Anyway, Kimberly called me one day and she said, Trent, I just met a real mama bear. She needs to be the next the governor of Nebraska, and you need to meet Teresa Thibodeau. Three days later, we met in Wahoo, Nebraska, and three hours later, I, I never recognized all the threes until right now I'm telling you this story. Three hours later, we realized that this lady who comes from Omaha, a completely different walk of life than myself, a sixth generation farmer slash rancher, we did not find one single policy issue that we disagreed on. And so we we left that day. And by the way, at that time, she was thinking about her husband actually said, Teresa, you need to run for governor because the patients, he's a medical doctor, the patients that I'm talking to, they're not happy with their choices. You need to run. 
And so she was exploring that idea and we visited and I think I helped push her over the edge a little bit, which, you know, one day she may come back and haunt me about that pushing. But regardless, um, two weeks later, she decided that she was going to run for governor. The next morning, Chrissy, this is quite interesting. She called me and she said, Trent, guess what I just learned? You know, my father. I'm like, what? (laughs) Well, it turns out her father is Thomas Sanderson who sits next to me and has for the past three years on the Capitol Commission, because the governor appointed myself and Thomas to be on a commission that actually keeps, maintains the upkeep of the state Capitol and and we keep it warm and and friendly and educational and, and healthy. For example, you got a dome on these buildings and you want that dome to be beautiful. And we've got this gold enamel on there, but it deteriorates over time. And so here I've sat next to her father on a Capitol Commission for the past three years. The world just keeps going in circles is the moral of the story. And and she decided that she was going to run for governor. And then in uh, January, I actually went to visit with my existing governor, Pete Ricketts, who's termed out, which is why we're running, because he's no longer uh, able because of term limits to be the next governor. I said, Governor, I'm going to I've never done this before. But I truly believe Teresa Thibodeau needs to be the next governor of Nebraska following what you've put in place so well. And uh, I'm going to do a public endorsement. And he said only positive things about what a wonderful person she is and how she is so qualified for that position. I did that endorsement with no intention to ever be a part of politics. And three weeks ago, Teresa came to me and she said, you know, Trent, we bring this great dynamic a presentation as a team because I am from Omaha. That's been my life. She's been a part of the GOP in Douglas County, which is in Omaha. And you are sixth generation farmer, rancher. We need all 93 counties in this state to come together. We can't continue to be divided between rural and urban. Would you be my lieutenant governor running mate? And I was, no way. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> uh, and then Kelly, my wife and I, we talked about it uh, for about a week, actually. We talked about it. We talk, thought about the sacrifice. And then we recognized that what I've been attempting to do for 22 years, mm-hmm. and I should say what we've been attempting to do, because Kelly is the one that holds the ranch down, takes care of, of critters and kids while I'm out talking about the importance of food production as a means of national security. And we said, you know, this is going to create opportunities and platforms to really get a bigger voice about the importance of food production and energy production as a means of national security. And Chrissy, I have to tell you that we've made the announcement last Thursday. So today is the seventh day since it's been known that I am the Lieutenant Governor running mate. And I have uh, achieved more opportunities to talk about the importance of food production at the domestic production level in seven days than I did probably or for sure in the last seven months. So it creates opportunities just to to explain that we cannot continue to destroy the infrastructure of food production. We are destroying the infrastructure of energy production. You know, in 2018, we were oil independent. In the United States, we didn't rely on even Canada for our oil. And we have lost that. We've lost that since 2018 already. Basically, it all happened on January 27th, 2021 with an executive order, which is 18004. And we're crippling our energy production and our ability to produce our own fuel. And we're trying to do the same thing to food. And so we need to stand up to those things. And we need a governor who is a true mama bear to protect the people of this state. And that's how we got to this point. Yeah, I yeah, that's incredible. And uh, I know you've had Governor Pete Ricketts on your show many times. And so what do you value most about his governorship? He uh, he did a fantastic job. I constantly through uh, through the COVID issues, I was sending him a weekly report, like a weekly um, grade on how well he was doing, <laughs> despite whether he wanted it or not. I was just <laughs> sending it to him, comparing him to other governors in the nation. But you know, you know, he did a tremendous job at balancing the noise that you must hear as a governor, and yet never losing sight of the fact that we live in a country where we the people is how the preamble of the Constitution starts. It's about we the people. And he continually put we the people on the forefront and did a fantastic job keeping people with their freedom. We had a period of time where 
he was listening to people in the medical community that I, I didn't believe he was getting sound information in the big picture. He got us through COVID. I mean, we, we've moved beyond that um, without losing the freedoms that we should not have lost at a very minimal level. But most importantly, what Governor Ricketts has done for the past eight years and what he taught me, I was able to accompany him on a trade mission to Japan. Wow. 97% of the world's population lives somewhere other than the North American continent. And if we are going to continue to thrive as a nation, we need to export the commodities that we produce on farms mm -hmm. and ranches. And Nebraska is the number one state for meat production. Nebraska is the number one state for beef cattle production. And we export to people around the world. And we are now exporting five times more beef to China, thanks to Another friend of mine, Greg Dowd, who negotiated the phase one China deal with the U.S. Trade Representative's Office under President Trump. But Governor Ricketts, by the way, was appointed as on the Committee for International Trade by President Trump. That's how, how much of a stellar for trade and, and understanding the international aspect. So from that standpoint and being a champion for all things good in the state of Nebraska. That's what Governor Ricketts did and what he, I was able to watch because so many days I was alongside when he was making that happen. So he put us in a great position. I said yes, because I believe the next governor is going to be vitally important to, to take that good position and go to a whole new level. Definitely. I heard him on, on Glenn Beck the other day and talking about vetoing uh, any more assistance from the federal government. And so, so why do what, in your opinion, why, why did he make that decision? Uh, make the decision to not take any more money because the money that we're taking now is going into particularly nonprofit organizations that are working at eroding the freedom and the property rights and everything that we stand for. Um, you need to earn a dollar, not be handed a dollar. And, you know, he is a very much a businessman. And that's the premise that the whole Ricketts family has been under as long as I've known them or anybody's known about them. They are from Nebraska originally. The, the handouts that are coming left and right are causing problems in the country, literally destroying small and rural communities. And you just got to say no. You got to learn how to say no to the federal government. And I think we take that to the next level. One thing that I've been very passionate about, Chrissy, for 20 years is that we have the, the USDA established uh, guidelines for feeding our kids, for feeding the military, for feeding elderly in any institution. And those dietary guidelines are really messed up. They're putting our kids on a path of starvation and depredation. And in fact, you can find, if you go to PubMed, National Institutes of Health, you can find a report that documents 95% of the people that comprise of this committee have a conflict of interest with a food company that yields results because of the dietary guidelines that are put forth. You go beyond all of that, the schools and people in the school systems know that these, these diets that they have kids on is a path of starvation and depredation, yet they continue to do it. Why? Because they get payments from the USDA for following the guidelines. And we need to get away from those strings that are attached where the federal government says, you do this our way and we'll give you a check. Well, you know what? Back in the old days, we called that prostitution. And so we need to get away from that. We need people to earn their own way, contribute to society, and then reap the rewards of what you've done to improve the environment, to improve the e economy, and to improve your community. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I know that you are an action person, not just a talk about it person. And um, uh Teresa is quoted as saying, Trent and I agree that we must bridge the rural versus urban divide for Nebraska to move forward. So how is that even possible? What is the plan? Well, the plan is, and, and this is my, my saying, so watch the follow through, but mm -hmm. we need, and, and I've contributed to this problem. Everybody knows who's listened to me or, or read what I've written or just had a conversation with me. We've talked about the rural urban divide for as long as I've been involved with this. We do it at the national level. We do it at the state level. And in some cases, we even do it at the county level. We got to stop talking about red counties, blue counties. We got to start talking about red, white, and blue counties. We need counties that come together. We not want everybody to think alike. That's the power of the representative republic that we live in, is that 
every person has the ability to think what they think and then collectively come together with a compromise at the end of the day and go forward. We're not even having the discussion today. The divide has gotten to be so bad that we don't have the discussion with people that we don't agree on. That's a problem. And so one thing that I will say that I've been able to do quite successfully, and one reason why I'm called all over the nation when there's a a tough situation, I'll give you an example. I was invited to Burns, Oregon during the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge standoff. I was invited to moderate a town hall meeting because when I moderate a town hall meeting in which we had about 400 people there that night in Burns, Oregon, um, you can get, you will get, you should get emotions that come into play, Mm -hmm. but you never lose respect. You have respect for people and their thoughts, no matter how stupid you might think they are, it doesn't matter. They think your ideas are stupid too, but you have respect for the person that you're talking to and you're talking about, and you sit down and say, where actually do we agree? And that sounds like some kind of a purple crayon sit sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya, but if we don't at some level sit down and and have a respectful conversation with the people that we don't agree with, this is not new. Somebody once said, United we stand, divided we fall. Well, we have people that are dividing us quite nicely. It's time we get back to the red, white, and the blue, and we stand together and say, yeah, we don't all agree on this. But at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're trying to create a better opportunity for those kids, the next generation, who, by the way, are watching our actions, whether they're speaking up or not, they're watching how we act every single day. And I want to make sure that we're planting the right seeds in their mind on how we go forward as one nation. For sure. And so I I jotted down a few topics that are important to voters all over the U.S., not just Nebraska. Um, And for each topic, I want to know what the problem is, your opinion on why it's important and what the stance is. And, you know, kind of you don't have all the answers, I know, but what can be done about it? So I have one answer for every question you're going to give me. So just go ahead, get started, and I'll, I'll get you to that right. one answer. <laughs> okay. Property rights and 30 by 30. Uh, empower the people. Mm-hmm. That's my one answer. That's our mission as a team, governor, lieutenant governor, is empower the people. Yeah. We've set back in property rights. We've set back and, and wanted to see what the capital or the federal government is going to do to help us achieve our property rights. They're not going to do anything but take them away. As bad as the federal government is, the state government will do the same thing. So you become a dutiful citizen and you engage locally. My role as lieutenant governor is going to be primarily to provide a flow of information to the citizens of each county to make sure that they're doing what they can be doing locally to control the initiatives behind 30 by 30, which is to take 30% of the land, 30% of the water by 2030 and to return it to its natural state through a conservation easement. Well, when you take in a combination with the 45% they've already got control of, you're talking about three and four acres that would be under the control of the federal government. Who's happy with that? Nobody's happy with that. But what we had happen in Nebraska, which needs to happen every, it's not happening anywhere east of the Mississippi, by the way. We need to get people east of the Mississippi engaged in this 30 by 30 discussion. But we had, I think the last count was 57 counties in the state of Nebraska alone who adopted a resolution and said publicly, We do not want 30 by 30. We do not want federal overreach in our county. And so we need uh, leaders at the state government, which are getting information to those local officials on how to stand up and make sure that we protect our property rights. Quite frankly, our thoughts are our property. Too many times people say, well, I don't own any land, so that doesn't affect me. You own your thoughts Mm -hmm. and your thoughts are your property. And we are being told how to think. We need to get back to critical thinking and we need to empower people to get that done. Yeah. All right. Next issue, meatpacker issues. Is there anything that can be done on the state level, not just in cattle markets, but pork, poultry? How can we get food from farm to consumer in a way that benefits both parties? So everybody wants some uh, initiative to clamp down on the, let's talk about beef, which uh, poultry is, is gone. Uh, at that level. Pork is about the same, although not as bad as beef in terms of consolidation with the large four packers that own too much of the whole. They got too big of a pie. 
Let's just put it that way. But Chrissy, I'm not one that thinks that we fix that by trying to put rules in place. We put rules in place. We got a Packers and Stockyard Act. We got a constitution that I pack around in my pocket every single day. Glad I turned that off for us, our conversation. I, I, I got a constitution I pack around in my pocket every single day. We don't follow the constitution now. We need accountability. We need to make sure that people who do things illegally or unconstitutional are, are held accountable to that. The role of the state government, in my mind, is to empower the people at the local level. Because why are there are not more small, medium-sized packing plants in each state? Yeah. Right now, it's labor. They can't find anybody to show up to work. In fact, I deliver pigs to a, a small local locker every other week, and they've asked me to throttle back. And I'm not, I'm talking like 20 every other week, small numbers, but they've asked me to throttle back because there are people that are showing up are just working too hard. Why are they working too hard? Because it's hard to hire people following the guidelines that are put forth by the Department of Labor and everything else. And so what we need is fewer hurdles for small business owners and more information on how to connect with people in their local community. The answer to the future, the answer to the consolidation in the food business, not just the meatpacking business, because one food company owns just about every brand you can think of other than meat products. It all comes back to 3G capital. If you look at what they actually own, it's very concerning. So we reduce the regulation, the restrictions, and we put more incentive in creating these local food economies People have been talking about local food for a long time, but I think they were misguided in what they were talking about in local food. They were talking about local food with little buzzwords in it, like organic and this and that. That really doesn't matter. What matters is that you build your local community economy. You do it with people that you rely on that contribute to the same school funds that you do. And you do all of these things in a local manner. And if we have people taking, stop going to the super center on the edge of town, if you're unhappy with the consolidation in the food business, if you're shopping at the super center, you're causing the consolidation where you spend your dollar matters. And so from a state government standpoint, we just get a tremendous amount of information flowing to the people about how you make these choices, which build the community. And that's what it's about is building local communities. Awesome. Next topic. Did I mention change. empower the people? That too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Climate change. I think people like Cory Booker and Ilhan Omar, they probably know how to take care of the land better than the farmer, right? Well, they do. They think they do. They <laughs> sure talk about it a lot. You know, this climate change thing is extremely concerning. And I now fully understand it, it all started in 1994. Rio de Janeiro, the United Nations put on a, a climate change summit. And as a result of that, 30 by 30 came out of that, by the way. Wow, that was really? that long ago. Even though wow. we just had nations start adopting it in 2022, it came up in 1994. Hmm. In 1994, they also knew they needed to demonize things in order to get people afraid to move in one direction. So we demonize carbon dioxide. Okay, now we have initiatives and we're throwing millions of dollars, trillions of dollars, actually. And the United Nations says, we need to bury, bury three trillion tons of CO2 by 2030. What is CO2? CO2 is in the Earth's atmosphere at 0.04%. Just a quick atmospheric scientific lesson. Nitrous oxide, excuse me, 78%. Oxygen, 21%. Argon, 0.9%. And all those other things, methane, carbon dioxide, are less than a half a percent across the board. And those are the ones that we're trying to, we have been demonizing and want to take care of, and we have to have carbon sequestration. Farmers have been sequestering carbon as long as they've been growing something. That's what we do. We build the soil health. We build the organic matter in the topsoil. And then we carbon comes back and is part of that system in a cycle of life. And carbon operates on about a 10-year cycle. So now we're talking about burying this carbon dioxide, which in the bigger picture is plant food. Yeah. We're going to bury 3 trillion tons of plant food and expect the plants to grow. That makes no sense whatsoever. Scientific data after scientific data has documented that as you increase the Earth's atmosphere of carbon dioxide, you grow more plants. When you grow more plants, 
you produce more photosynthesis. Plants absorb carbon dioxide. In fact, an interesting side note that you can look at the infrared uh, images of the United States and during the height of the farm growing season, July, for corn, you will see four times more photosynthesis taking place in the United States corn crop than the Amazon rainforest. Wow. So the answer is grow more plants because the more plants you have, the more carbon dioxide you get from the atmosphere to feed the plants, the more oxygen you produce. The plants feed animals or they feed people. 75% of the Earth's surface cannot be, um, cannot produce food for a human being, but it'll produce food for a ruminant an animal, which take the cellulose material, turn it into the most nutrient dense food substance on the planet. Beef, nothing compares to beef when it comes to nutrient density. People eat the beef, they wear the, the leather, they use the steric acid for the gizmos that you and I are doing to be a part of this. They put them in their tires, and then we take the fertilizer, we put it back in the soil, build soil health. It's called the cycle of life. And we have people right now trying to say that we, if we just remove one sector of that cycle of life, we'll have a healthier planet. Nothing could be further from the truth than that will destroy the healthy planet. And the whole climate change, there's no doubt climate's changing. Climate has always changed, it always will change. In fact, if you really look at the science and the climate, we're coming upon a 400-year weather cycle that's not going to be pretty. But it's called a weather cycle for a reason. God created the earth in a circle because everything else is in a circle. Everything begin, There's no beginning, there's no ending. You just be, you're part of that cycle of life, and you do what you can to enhance and improve it while you're here. So, again, I'm going to work in Empower the People because people just need to know. Number one, if you bury your plant food, CO2, you're going to have to expect fewer plants. It's that simple. Yeah. Well, even greenhouses. I've been on hundreds Absolutely. of greenhouses that pump carbon dioxide into the greenhouse to feed the plants. Like Exactly. Basic, you know, Science. people just need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So the next, the next two topics aren't ag-focused, but they... They affect everybody, whether you're inside of agriculture or not. All right. So men taking over women's sports. Uh, that is ridiculous. I need to stop now. End of story. <laughs> There's no, for, no, no place yeah. to go with that. Yep. Just Indoctr get, get it, get it done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Indoctrination of children at school, whether it's sex ed or CRT. That is the number one priority of our administration. And the number one priority that every state and every parent in the world should adopt. Our kids have been indoctrinated. The education system has been hijacked from us because we've been complacent. We've been expecting them to do that right. Job one, fix education. When you fix education, every other thing we talked about here, Chrissy, will come in line. But until we get the kids... We have kids who are designating themselves as furries in school thinking, today I feel like I'm a cat. So they demand a litter box to go in the restroom. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that is wrong. And we need strong people to take a stand. And, and that's really where the mama bears come in. The mama bears are going to lead this because they're tired of what their kids have been told. One just basic thing that kind of ties us all together. I've spoken in three high schools in the last month. And I can tell that these kids are emulating what they hear every single day. And they believe that population growth is outpacing the ability for us to produce enough food to match it. That's blatantly false. Yeah. If we keep destroying the infrastructure of food production, if we keep burying plant food, if we keep going down this, pan this path of doing all of these things, that will be a problem. But if we just turn freedom on its course and let the farmer be an ingenuity, adopt technology, and implement all of these technological advancements that we know how to do in improving soil health and keeping the cycle of life running, there will be no problem whatsoever producing enough food to feed a population spike that 10 billion plus, it doesn't matter. So it comes back to education, and that's where everything starts. Yeah. All right. Election integrity. Election integrity. We have too many dead people voting. It's a problem. We've, we've documented that the, in the state of Nebraska. I can speak to this quickly because we've been on this campaign and we've been listening to people in county clerk offices. Their mechanism currently for removing people who have passed is to watch the local obituaries and then go physically remove them. That's antiquated. We have a phone that we know where we're at at all times and what we're doing, and we can't 
have an electronic system that comes in and removes people that have passed. And we, if, if we're using machines, there needs to be transparency about what these machines are actually doing and how the accountability comes with these machines. So election integrity is uh, one of the top issues that we're talking about. And but here's the bottom line. We sit back and we say, well, I've talked to my senator about election integrity, and I just don't think he or she's doing enough about it. You're talking to the people who got elected by the system that's in place. Exactly. Are they going to say, mm, you know, maybe I got elected incorrectly? No, they're not. So I'm going to come back to something I think I said previously. Empower the people to go to the courthouse, ask questions about voter integrity in their own county. That's how we solve it. It seems to be redundant, but we are all about <laughs> empowering the people. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And uh, last one of these ones is social credit score, or digital dollar. Is there a way to protect your state? I'm not a digital currency guy in any way, shape or form. I think every, here we are talking about whether machines can be hacked or not. At the same time, we're talking about moving our money to digital currency. Mm-hmm. I happen to like greenbacks money in my billfold cash. I think that that's the way that we go forward. I, I don't know that I'm going to throw a red flag. I'm going to supply information to people about uh, what the currency should be. The central bank seems to have too much control. The federal government has too much control over the money, period. Mostly I'm concerned right now about what's happening in the Middle East because we had a deal with the Middle Eastern OPEC oil producing nations that all oil in the world was traded on the American dollar. Yeah. And last week, it switched and uh, Russia says, we're going to buy oil and we're paying in rubles. They agreed. What does that mean for the rest of us? So I think that currency is a place that I need to become better, a better student on. But I do know that we need to be careful and protect the assets that we have. And digital currency does not seem to be the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it you know, over the last 25 months, it seems that Republican governors have taken an interesting turn. Um, the ones, the good ones appear to be taking, like you've been saying, this protective role over the people right. um, against the musings of the federal government, right? So if you look at, obviously, DeSantis or my DeSantis, as I like to call him, <laughs> my governor, he's uh, really stepped out and become a real protector over the rights and freedoms of Floridians. So do you think this is going to inspire more gov- governors? You kind of touched on this at the beginning. And give them the courage to lead with authority and real action, not just pretty words and tax cuts. Um, It's not until the people get loud enough that they demand it. Yeah. It comes back to what the people are willing to exercise in terms of their right to stand up and be heard. Yeah. Good answer. And my last question for you, what role does faith play in your life and how does it affect your decision making? Uh, God put me in this position. He he brought me here and he basically said that we need strong Christian men and women. Women seem to be strong at all times, but we had too many men that have been weak. And uh, he he's a driving force behind what we do. And we have raised our three three daughters in the name of Jesus Christ. And if it wasn't his will, I would not be here. Very good. Anything else you want to say? Thanks for the opportunity to come and join you again. I thought you plum forgot where I was at, what I was doing, but it's good to see you. You too. And thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for your words and your service. And I'm excited for your future for sure. And we could use a couple of hundred dollar donations if you got a spare hundred dollar bill laying around. We will include links.com. Awesome. We'll include that in the, in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all who are watching or listening. If you want to learn more, like I said, the links will be provided in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight YouTube, Rumble, AgFuse. We're even on Getter now, um, Telegram, and the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And have a great day. Thanks so much for listening to today's Egg Spotlight episode where we put the spotlight on people and companies doing great things for the agricultural industry. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcasting platform and give us a five-star review. You can also follow us on YouTube and Rumble to see the video version of Ag Spotlight. 
Also, head on over to NorthAmericanAg.com to subscribe to our Industry Connect update newsletter. If you're interested in advertising opportunities, email us at connect at NorthAmericanAg.com. Thanks for listening. Our newest podcast by North American Ag is called What Color Is Your Tractor? The stories behind the ag brands you love and the ag brands you love to hate. Hosted by me, Chrissy Wozniak. We take a deep dive into the companies that have built modern agriculture. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform. Go to whatcolorisyourtractor.com. Available on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts.